And uh, today we have our wonderful speakers, and they all have some relation with Taiwan, like <laughs> James, Spencer, and also uh, David. She also has some relation with Taiwan. So well, this is not Taiwan data. But, but uh, let's start the first talk. My Dorothy Lane is um, coming from UC Irvine, and he became a partial experimentalist. And uh, he will talk about his new proposal of data. Hello? Okay, good. All right, so uh, yes, I'm very thankful to be invited to come. So I thank the organizers. It's been a long time since I was here. Uh, so I'm going to talk about PHASER, which is this uh, acronym for the Forward Search Experiment uh, at the LHC. So let me start at the very beginning. <clears throat> we, of course, are looking for new particles. And one way to organize this in an incredibly model independent way is to put it on this uh, plot where you have particles with some mass here and some interaction strength. And um, you can sort of just envision what kind of particles there could be and what you could do to look for them. So up here, we have, of course, already discovered weak or uh, strongly interacting particles that are light. Uh, down here, it's very hard to envision ways to look for them, especially in particle physics experiments, where you have very heavy extremely weakly interacting particles. And then in the middle here is then where all the action is, where one can hope to find things that haven't been excluded of it. Now, if you look at our field, of course, we sort of started in this plane with the electron over here somewhere. And ever since 1895, we've been marching along this way, following E.O. Lawrence and building bigger and bigger colliders until we find more and more particles. And that's been extremely productive. And so now we're sort of here in the sort of TEV uh, range. And um, this is really the traditional target of big science, looking for things like extra dimension, the TV scale, uh, SUSY, and things like that. But there is another way to go, which is down here. And if this is the E.O. Lawrence direction, I would call this the Fred Reines direction, looking down to things that are more and more weakly interacting and light. And um, alternatively, you can say we're going down this diagonal, since this is already excluded, but we've already seen it, we could say we're going down this diagonal, weakly interacting sort of micro milli charge stuff at the MEV to GVCL. And I would say, you know, a large trend in recent years is to look down here, and these are the new targets for small experiments. So what is the idea of phaser? Phaser is to do that. So if you look at the LHC, new physics, is, uh, of course, the major target of the LHC. And most of the searches are focused on high PT. So uh, this is appropriate for heavy, strongly interacting particles. You know, you make a TEV mass particle. It's very heavy. There's not much energy to go around, so it just sits there. Then it decays, and it decays isopropically, no boost. And typically, you get, you know, femtoform, picoform, sort of class sections for these sort of things. Given the little masses of LHC, thousands, millions of events and you can produce isopropically, so a high PT is a very good way to go. However, if new particles are actually light and weakly interacting, the strategy that is sort of subconsciously adopted by the LHC, ATLAS and CMS in particular, may be completely misguided. First of all, if it's weakly interacting, like microcharge or millicharge, you need extremely large standard model rates to see these things, because they're very weak processes, very rare processes. And so a thousand or a million events is nowhere near enough to see something that's coupled with a microcharge shift where all the event rates are suppressed like that really well. Second of all, if they're light, you can produce them in the case of things like pions, kaons, Ds, and B mesons. And so you should go basically where these things are prevalent, which is not actually at high PT. So the conclusion of this very simple argument is that you should go, if you want to look for light, weakly interacting particles, to where the pions are and uh, all the other sort of light particles. And that is at low PT along the beam line. The inelastic cross-section at the LHC, as opposed to femtobarn or picobarn, is 100 millibarns, so many orders of magnitude higher. So that means given the LHC and HL-LHC luminosities, you're talking about 10 to 17 events coming down this beam pipe. Um, and actually about 10% of the pions that are produced at this interaction point 
are produced within two mm radians of the beam line. Okay, so it's incredibly over dense in this region, and very few of them coming up in this region. So that means you should put a detector down along the beam line. Of course, if you think about that for a second, you know you can't put a detector right along the beam line, right in front of the IP, because that will block the beam from coming in, and therefore you won't be able to get any collisions. However, corollary to things being weakly interacting is that they also typically live a long time. So we don't have to put something like right here. We can actually go down this beam line, say, hundreds of meters, and put something down here, which is along the beam collision axis, yet won't block the beam because the beam beams move the beam's curve. Now, you can do a little simple calculation and say how big, if you go 100 meters down here, you might think you need to build an enormous collider because things are going to spread out a lot. But if you take 100 meters and multiply it by a milliradian, you find it's 10 centimeters. So 10% of your pions are still going so that 100 meters from now, they're still just spread out like 10 centimeters down here. So they're still extremely collimated, and you can take a little tiny detector and stick it there and find these things. And so these very, very general, I hope it's obvious I'm being very general here, <laughs> are uh, motivating a small, fast, inexpensive experiment. Uh, you place it down here, it doesn't have to be very big. Typical dimension 10 centimeters is enough. And that is exactly what phaser is. That's basically the whole idea of this phaser experiment. Okay, so let me give you a few more details on where it is. Um, so this is the LHC beam line. Here's TMS and Atlas. And so we're looking for points here that are, say, a few hundred meters down the beam line from those IPs. If you look at Atlas, Atlas, uh, in addition to being nice and convenient near the center of CERN, near the theory group, also has a lot of stuff going on here. And so this is probably the best place to look. So if you focus in on that, here is a magnified view version. And you see that if you go down Atlas, there's actually a point here, which is turns out 480 meters from the IP, where there's another tunnel that comes out, which uh, is actually where the beam collision axis goes. This tunnel used to be to supply electrons from the SPS to LEC, uh, but now it's completely condemned and shut down. It's unused, but it's sitting there. So then if you go down to the tunnel and you look, well, okay, first of all, here's a map on, from the sort of uh, airplane view. So here's Atlas, most of the places, of course, uh, theorists hang out here. Then you go almost due east, and here's this place where this tunnel TI-12 comes out. And you see that the beam line goes straight for 270 meters and then it starts curving away. And so this is actually on the beam collision axis, not this. So it's a little bit upset. You go down there and you look. This is the view looking west. So we're starting here, standing right here and looking in that direction. And you see then the LHC beam line is on your right. And this tunnel, which is TI-12, uh, is on the right, on the left. And right here is where the beam collision axis goes. So we like to say that here is the visible sector, and here is kind of dark, but that's the good place to look for the dark sector. OK, maybe just one more plot of this. Um, so what, what are we looking for? So a typical phaser event, you have at the IP produced some uh, long-lived particle. It then travels down this beam line. Uh, goes about 380 meters before anything happens. Then it passes through 100 meters of concrete and rock. Then it enters over here, this TI-12, this, this uh, empty tunnel. And if you put a detector right there, uh, you can see, for example, that that particle, you know, maybe it's an axion that decays to two photons, maybe it's a dark photon that decays to two electrons, E plus E minus. You can look for that charged visible stuff here and, and see uh, physics. Okay, so, um, so this was the original idea, uh, which is a paper that came out with Ifta Galan, Sebastian Jordanowski, and Felix Kling uh, a little bit over a year ago. Um, by now, this is developed into a full-blown project, and as you'll see, it's quite mature. Um, the first thing is that the CERN survey team has actually found out exactly where this beam comes out, this beam collision axis. Uh, they located it with a millimeter accuracy. 
turned out it's unfortunately slightly low, and it is coming out of the floor here. This is a very steeply rising tunnel. And so we have to actually have, have to excavate a little bit here, but not so much, about half a meter down this end. And this is the uh, view of what this detector will look like when it's all installed. So we need to dig a little hole here, stick the detector there, and this is various support things like computing and stuff like that. Uh, one interesting question you might have is, uh, we know that the beam collision axis actually moves because of the beam crossing angle. The beams, of course, aren't completely um, head on because if they were, they would disrupt each other. So they're at a slight angle. That angle actually moves this beam collision axis, and it moves it given current plans by something like 10 centimeters up and down. And so the beam collision axis actually is like to go up and down about 10 centimeters um, in coming months. It's not that regular. And it's, in fact, right now, well, it is regular once they decide what to do. But right now, they haven't decided what to do. Um, it depends a lot. They, they basically move the beam collision, they move the crossing angle to avoid irradiating certain magnets too much in one place. So they kind of try to spread the radiation out to not destroy the magnets. And there's all sorts of discussion about the plans for the coming run and the HL there. Um, right now, in, it's actually very interesting. In Atlas, it's actually a vertical displacement, and the CMS is horizontal. So right now, the expectation is that it will be, it'll be that way, vertical at Atlas. And if we're lucky, it might even come up a little bit. But um, yeah, it's still under discussion. OK, so that's a quick overview of the experiment. So let me tell you just about some of the physics that can be done there. So let me just give you first an example of the dark photons. Um, OK, so you know, the whole idea was to look for rare pion decays. So where are the pions? So these are the pions produced at the interaction point to get at this. So this is a plot. Here's the angle relative to the beam line, beta, and it's a logarithmic scale. Okay? And then this is the P the momentum of the uh, ion. And then this is bin, and you see the color of the heat map giving you the event rate in each bin. So first thing to say is that these data are much, much more well understood. Uh, these expectations are much more well understood than they were, say, five, 10 years ago. Because you know this is obviously very non perturbative physics. But there are other experiments that are doing great job, uh, TOTEM, LHCF, like that, that do forward physics, which have sort of pinned down the expectations for these sort of networks. So the simulations have really been refined a lot by existing LHC data. Basically, these things should be certain to be the factor of two or something. Uh, the production, as you might expect, is peak at a PT around lambda QCD of 250 MeV. That's this line here. So that's PT, so that's a diagonal in the beta and P plane. And um, you know, there's this ridge with very high event numbers along PT of lambda QCT. So that's another thing to note. And the third thing is there's enormous event rates, as I already told you. So each of these bins, these purple things, have like 10 to the 16, 10 to the 15 events in them. Each one of them, and there's been uh, five bins per decade. So there's 10 to the 16, 10 to the 17 events of them in this plot. Now, okay, we need a huge event rate because we're looking for, for example, our photons produced from pi and decay. So pi of course, decay to gamma gamma. They can also be decay to gamma dark photon if the dark photon is light enough. So let's assume the dark photon is 100 MeV. The coupling is incredibly small, 10 to the minus 5 of you know the electromagnetic coupling. So then where are the event rates and distributions for dark photons coming out of pion decay? Well, they look like this. Obviously, they're derived from the pion one, so they look very similar to that one, except that the scale has been normalized again. So this now, these purple are actually 10 to the 5 events, not 10 to the 15. Okay. But as I said before, it's incredibly peaked along low PT. Uh, the event rates are highly suppressed by this epsilon 10 to the minus 5. It suppresses the event rate by 10 to the minus 10. But still, you still see that in each bin here, there's like 10 to the 5 dark photons. Okay, so the event rates are still pretty good. Now, of course, we can't see all dark photons. We only see the ones that decay in phases. So let's ask yet another question. Of this population, how many of them actually decay in this envisioned phaser detector? Um, and uh, for parameters that are a little bit out of date right now, but it's irrelevant to this, here's the answer. So this is what you get. 
only highly boosted uh, photons, sort of like TEV energies, actually decay in phaser because they have to be very boosted to get that far, to go 400 meters. Okay. The event rate is again suppressed because of the decay requirement, because now you have to have the decay, say, in this three meter range and not just anywhere. So, of course, that kills your rate a lot. But nevertheless, you still get, you know, this is tens, hundreds of events that are decaying in your little three meter volume. And the other thing that's quite interesting is the requirement that it be in that very narrow angle and the requirement that it's highly boosted are correlated, so you don't lose any extra event rate. So all the events, all the dark photons that could have got to you are extraordinarily collimated, and they're going to show up within 10 centimeters of this beam line. Okay, so that's the kind of explication you get. You get huge rates and huge suppressions, and you hope that you end up with some event rate crystals. <coughs> So then you go and do some study where you include all the bells and whistles. Here's the dark photon uh, parameter plot. Here's the dark photon mass from the GeV to 10 MeV. Here's this coupling epsilon, which I the previous slide could be 10 to minus 5. Okay. Um, all these gray regions are excluded by current experiments. And this is event rates for various production mechanisms for these dark photons. So you can get them from pion decay, eta decay, Bremsfrollum, Bremsfrollum, things like this. Um, but the point is that if you combine all these and ask what is your sensitivity, uh, this is sort of regions that can be probed by phaser one and phaser two. So phaser one is the thing that's going to be built there starting in about a month. So this is a uh, radius of 10 centimeters, length of 1.5 meters, starting in run three. Phaser 2 is an envisioned, much more fuzzy, but an envisioned uh, upgrade, which would be one meter in radius, five meters in length, and then for the LHC, high luminosity error. So what do you see? So you see that um, Phaser can actually probe new parameter space here, quite a large chunk, I would say. On here also are other experiments, MA62, Sequest, and of course SHIP, which is sort of the giant big gorilla in this game. Ship goes all the way down here and then comes back here, somewhere like this, and phaser is absolutely not compared to the ship down here. But at the high epsilon region, ship and phaser are pretty comparable. And so phaser would sort of um, be able to do what ship can do at a very reduced cost. I'll show you that in a second. Another thing that's very important to note is if you look at the event rates here, um, you know, the contours are very bunched here. So you require three events for discovery, 10 events, 50 events, it changes the contours almost not at all. And so it doesn't really matter what you think your signal efficiency is as long as it's like 10% or 50% is fine. And last, there's some incredible regions here where you could actually have event rates that are so large that you know, you're predicting seeing a signal once every like hour. Okay, so that's dark photons. Um, what else do we once you have this detector, this little toy, you can play with it and do all sorts of other things. Uh, dark Higgs bosons, um, so I'll just give you a very quick overview here. Dark Higgs bosons can be produced, say, in B decay, so B to S dark Higgs boson, and we can probe new parameter space in this case. A fun thing you can do is look for B to S double dark Higgs production, which is through a Higgs, dark Higgs, dark Higgs trilinear vertex. We can actually probe parameter space by looking for these sort of things too. Um, so we're uh, in some ways competing with the exotic Higgs to case, Higgs to uh, dark photon, or dark Higgs, dark Higgs sort of things. And so we can also do stuff that might be typically thought of as a high energy um, exotic Higgs study. Um, then you can do ALPS. So ALPS are totally different. The process would be you have proton proton collisions making a pion that gives into two normal photons. But one of the photons will eventually collide into this thing called the TAN, the neutral target absorber. And that can, through the Primakov process, produce an ALP, which then goes another um, 300 meters and then decays to gamma gamma and phaser. And so you can also look for ALPs this way. You can look for ALPs that uh, have gluon couplings, off fermion couplings. And there's a bunch of plots like this now that are available which show that phaser has reached for all these things. And so, uh, just to summarize, uh, at this point, there's a lot of uh, long-lived particle scenarios that have been investigated. Here's a table. Um, 
this is even like formalized in something called the physics theory collider study at CERN. And so the check mark means you can discover new particles in unexcluded parameter space. Phaser can do, you know, sort of half of this menu. Phaser 2 can do almost all of it. And there are a variety of studies that have established these sort of things. Okay, so let me tell you just a quickly what stage we're in here. Uh, the detector is now fairly well, or phaser 1 is fairly well specified. So here it is. So this is where the particles come in from the Atlas IP. Um, there are scintillators. Um, there's this empty decay volume where the LLP, the long the particle with decay, and these three things, these red things are magnets, and they separate charged tracks. And so you get separated charged tracks. These blue things are trackers, and so they would be able to see the separated charged tracks. More scintillator back here, and then the um, electromagnetic calorimeter in the back. Um, so, you know, basically this is designed to look for things like this. Dark proton comes in. You see no signal passing through the veto scintillator at the front. So, invisible particle comes in, decays in your decay volume, the charge tracks. Those are then split apart by a magnetic field. You see hits on the trackers as you go along here. And then, in this case, you see the electromagnetic energy deposit in the color of uh, It's an extraordinarily spectacular signal because we have two high energy, like TEV electrons and positrons, showing up in this tunnel which is shielded from the IP by 100 meters of rock. And um, of course, the tracks point back to the IP. It's kind of like a light shining through walls sort of thing. I mean, it's an incredibly quiet environment. Um, and so we've, well, okay, let me go on. So we've done studies about the background. Um, I can say this, basically the studies have done, uh, been done by sort of theorists using EPOS, the simulator, and theory. Then, in a slightly more refined way, also by a FUCO study, and then yet in an even better way by actually in-situ measurements, which have actually already been done in the cliff phaser location. So let me just tell you a bit about these. The FUCO study and the EPOS plus theory studies agree, and they establish the fact that, sure enough, electrons, hadrons, of course, can't make it through 100 meters of stuff. And so uh, the only Standard model backgrounds are from uh, muons and neutrinos. The neutrino event rate is extremely small because its interaction costs are so small. The high energy muons that brown off a photon or some sort of jet are the leading background if you don't be to the incoming muon. And so, this is some results from this FUCA study done by the CERN FUCA department. And so, basically, we've established that if you have some veto scintillators at the front that can tell you if a muon has come in with very high efficiency, um, you can reject that background. Um, we've studied all sorts of other crazy things you might ask. Okay, so stuff, stuff that comes in from the IP down here doesn't go through 100 meters of rock, so that's not a background. But if you have something, some other beam over this direction, it's some gas in the, in the uh, beam line, then that knocks a proton off its trajectory, it sprays stuff into this tunnel this way, and then you're not shielded by anything, you can ask about that. And we've studied that, and that's also not uh, happening at um, significant levels. You can ask all sorts of other crazy ideas. Basically, we have yet to be able to find a significant background. And there's some very interesting facts about beam optics that, in fact, tell us that phaser is coincidentally at an incredibly quiet environment. If you moved it 50 meters that way or that way along the beam line, then your backgrounds go up by factors of a thousand. But we're just very fortunate. Uh, this is, we've actually now verified these simulations with data. We took us, during the technical stops, when they stopped the LHC for like a week, we ran down there, stuck an Walter detector down there, and um, looked for events there, pulled them af out after a few weeks, a few months. Um, this was done both with an emulsion detector to look for high energy particle backgrounds, and also something called a BATMON, a battery operated radiation monitor. We could look for low energy things that could potentially mess up detected electronics. And um, the bottom line is that all these seem to verify that the rates are very, very low. So here's a molten detector sitting along this beam collision axis. Um, here's this BATMON. And uh, everything looks very quiet up there. Um, my experimental colleagues have done all sorts of uh, work building this up. 
Um, and we've been very fortunate. We borrowed things from various places. So the tracker is uh, borrowed from the Atlas. Atlas made extra trackers because they thought that trackers would you know, degrade and need to be replaced. Turns out they haven't. And so there's like 324 of these sort of things sitting around in various rooms at CERN. And they were kind enough to give us 80 of them. So we take those and we form them into two by four tracking layers. Then we put three tracking layers together to form what we call a tracking station put three tracking stations in the detector, so we have nine planes of tracker, very high we can track for electrons and neurons. Um, and this was all free because it had uh, uh, this SCT data codes for free. Um, the calorimeter is made up from leftover parts of LHCP, so we're very grateful to them. They gave us free spare modules from their uh, eCal. And um, of course, we have to put them together and put the electronics around it and like that. But um, we were off to a great start because of all this kind of help we got from the other collaborations. Um, this magnet we actually have to build. No one had a magnet that met all our, spe met all our specifications. Uh, so the CERN magnet department is going to start building this in a few weeks. It's got a 20 centimeter diameter aperture and it's this very interesting permanent dipole magnet. Of course, once the LHC turns on, we can't go in there and you know monkey around with things. And so you have a permanent dipole magnet, requires no cooling, no anything. Um, and so that seems to be the way to go. So that's going to be constructed by CERN. So the current status of this project is that we now have 27 collaborators from 14 institutions in eight countries. And this is the list. A very important fact is there's only five theorists. This is a real collaboration, not just some monkeying around with theorists. Most of these people do real work. Here are the various institutions. Uh, we have an incredible amount of help from CERN people. Probably another 100 people have helped take part in this uh, project. Various things like civil engineering, how to dig this hole there, um, down to you know how to get the grants sorted out, and the finances. I mean, everything is, is uh, taken care of by some real experts, so we're very grateful for that. The timeline is that uh, there's been rapid progress since the first paper, the theory paper, which was just published you know, a year ago. Since then, um, we've submitted the letter of intent to the LHCC in July. Uh, that was reviewed favorably, and they asked us then to come back with a technical proposal. We submitted a technical proposal last month in November. This was also received favorably, and the LHCC then recommended approval to the final stop on this approval process, the CERN Research Board. The CERN Research Board asked us to finalize work integrating PHASER into the LS2 schedule. So of course it's an incredibly packed two years that are coming up and it's not easy to tell them, hey, we'd like to do some extra work. Uh, but nevertheless, we have a plan for that now. Once we finalize that, we'll go back to the Research Board and they uh, look like they will probably approve us in March for their next meeting. And in the meantime, various constructions are going on, in particular the magnet. In addition to the starting approval process, we're looking for funding. Um, the costs are uh, about $300,000 of Swiss francs, which will be borne by CERN, things like civil engineering. The additional cost of about a million to construct the uh, detector, and of course there's operations costs. And we have just received word that the two private foundations will fund us. And so all the funding has basically been um, secured. The costs. Um, I shouldn't go through this in detail, but basically, you know, the costs are now quite detailed, most of them. Um, and the bottom line is this is incredibly cheap for a CERN LHC detector. We're talking about a million dollars, and that's the whole thing. Here's the schedule. I know you can't read it, but the basic thing is that we start in January next month, and we go for about a year, year and a half, and we should be ready to run this thing when the run three starts again which is in 2021. There are, of course, many other very interesting experiments going on. Uh, SHIP, Medusa are two of the big ones. Code XB is very similar to us in many ways. Uh, the latest is that SHIP and Medusa have been basically uh, asked to submit to the European strategy process. So there's no way they can go forward until that thing winds down in 2020 or whatever. Um, of course, they're much bigger projects. They're sort of, you know, 100 million or more dollars or francs. So they're, they're understandably things that need to be put in the strategy process. 
uh, where this tiny little uplink here in summary you want to go forward a little bit faster. So the summary is that um, you know, this is an interesting opportunity to extend CERN's LHG uh, reach to small and inexpensive uh, experiment that can look for light and clear particles. Um, we just basically sit there when the LHG runs, we collect data. When they're down, we don't. Uh, we are now basically near the final goal of CERN approval and funding. And so the plan will be that uh, we'll install phaser in the coming two years, run for three years, um, and have new sensitivity to dark photons being as nice like as on its Alps. If that's successful, then uh, we would propose an upgrade detector which would run in the hydrogen last year, which will be bigger and can put almost all the standard uh, long wave particle scenarios. So, more information is at our web if you want to see. Okay, thank you. So, we have some time for questions. Can you show those reach plots again? I was, I was curious what the gray excluded regions are from the uh, Maybe this one for dark photons. So um, there's two broad regions. There's ones up here, which excludes sort of milli and more charged stuff. So this is from like typically Bell and Babar refractories. And then down here, there's a whole variety of experiments, which are uh, typically fixed time experiments. And so you, you know, send a beam into a pile of material, and then you go 60 meters or something down the way and look for something. And so these are things like um, uh, charm experiment E137 and E things like that. Uh, so they exclude this great region in here. Many of these are very old. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
you know, if, if for example, you know, something I know very well is like a heavy slap down, like a 200 GV metastable stable slap down. Those are actually just tiny in a tiny detector like this. And so, um, you know, those things can be looked by, by an analysis of CMS in the usual way. Oh, okay. It's not long enough. Yeah, and it's not big enough. I mean, and it just, you know, to the secular scale, this is covering a steradians of like 10 to the minus 8. <laughs> the steradian coverage for this is tiny, right? Any other questions? Okay, I want to ask you questions. Will you also look at the charge to pile? Because charge to pile has a longer lifetime so that you don't have such, you don't need such high energy. Right now you need TEV neutral pile. So mm -hmm, mm -hmm. if charge to pile on, that will be, I don't know, maybe much lower energy. Yeah, so that's very interesting. This is a good thing and a bad thing. Um, here, here's an example. So the, the charge to pile ions, like you say, they longer live, so they can carry this energy for you, sort of. But the problem is they have to get through this whole matrix of magnetic field. Oh, they go away. So typically they're bent out and they yeah. are. So if the charge plant decays to a neutral LLP very early, of course that will be sturdy. And then you can see that. But it doesn't benefit you if they're pretty sturdy. So yeah, if there's some clever way to think about how to do this, that'd be great. But um, right now we get no answer to that. Oh, uh, actually. How, uh, how much more expensive it would, would be longer? Like right now, the phase, phase two is five meters. Yeah, yeah. Will so it be much better if you can go to a, a 10 meters? I don't know. Yeah, yeah. So, um, let's see. Well, okay, so maybe it's the best spot to show it on. The, the thing you probably want to do, so you have to, if you want to make it longer, you have to make it like go like this. Oh. So this is a three meter detector. That 10 meter one isn't gonna fit in here, and it has to go out here. The, you know, I think that's just crazy because, you know, digging a new tunnel at LHC is a lot of money, but really the better way to think about it is this beam collision axis just goes behind this wall by about 50 centimeters. Oh, you'll hit the wall. Yeah, you'll hit the wall. But what you need to do is just basically um, widen this area, and that would be how you would do it. And it's true, this is actually, a, I think a 30 meters long wide area. So maybe um, if you're going to do some excavation or some construction, you might just do it all, just make it kind of 40 meters long. So that's not efficient for cost. So for the first stage, it's you know way more efficient just to stick it in a existing tunnel. But for the second stage, you know what you say is right, and we haven't actually considered uh, in detail how to do that. We've been frantically trying to pass all these approval processes to get phase one done. Uh, but as soon as we pass all these approvals. Experimentals will start actually constructing it, and the peers will go to start thinking about in detail how to do things into it. Any other questions? Uh, if not, let's thank uh, Jonathan again.